Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here. And I really also want to express my appreciation to our six distinguished guests from uh, far-flung points who are going to be um, speaking later. Um, and I really appreciate you all coming here. It is very rare for journalists to be able to carve out the time to um, spend some time taking a step back and, and, and looking at what we do, why we do, and thinking about what, how do we choose what we cover. And I hope you'll have the opportunity to do that today. I hope we'll, we'll make this worthwhile for you to, to, um, to have that, that chance. Um, let me just start out by telling you a little tiny bit about the Solutions Journalism Network. Is this my clicker? Um, <clears throat> no. OK. So um, we have a website, solutionsjournalism.org. And it's got all sorts of examples. We have a new downloadable toolkit about doing solutions journalism that's been downloaded in 100 countries already. We're a two-year-old organization, and our mission is this, to legitimize and spread the practice of solutions journalism, which we define as rigorous reporting about how people are responding to social problems and the results that they are getting. We work with newsrooms around the country, um, and um, that's one of the things we do. We've worked with probably about 40 different newsrooms in, in various ways, either doing projects with them, doing workshops. Here's some of them. As you can see, serious newsrooms. Um, this is sometimes confused for fluff, but it isn't. And we also have um, other projects. We have an online learning platform. And um, we are starting a network of solutions journalists and various hubs around the country. That's not yet up and running. So this morning, here's what I hope you'll get out of this workshop, to understand what is and isn't solutions journalism, to think about whether this is something that you should adopt as a practice you use when appropriate, and third, to learn how to do it. So let me start with what is solutions journalism. There's a problem in many cities, high crime rates. And it's a problem shared by, among other cities, Chicago and Fayetteville, North Carolina. And um, the Chicago Tribune did, wanted to do something different about crime. So they did a fantastic video and photo series going into neighborhoods that were most affected and having the affected people tell their own stories. And it was a great series. Um, Fayetteville took a different approach. And this is actually a great example of what we call solutions journalism. They assigned their investigative reporter, raise your hand, please, Greg Barnes, who's here today, to take a year off from doing what he normally does and instead travel around the southeast to other cities and look at what they were doing that was effective in improving public safety. Um, and he did a package of stories every month, which is quite extraordinary. Greg and one photographer. Um, and some gas money, or, and that's about it. Um, and really great series about what other cities were doing with the implication that here's what Fayetteville could learn from. Sometimes more than an implication, right? Sometimes outright stated. Here's what Fayetteville can learn from. So to help you understand a little bit more about what solutions journalism is, let me start with what it isn't. Um, these are the following our practices that are often confused for solutions journalism. Some of them are good journalism. They're just not what we're talking about. Some of them are not good journalism. But the first one is stories about heroes, the kinds of things you see the last minute of the nightly news or on CNN. These are stories that celebrate people for their great qualities, for their generosity, their selflessness, their courage. Um, but they're not really interested in whether what this person is doing is effective or not. And so therefore, they are not solutions journalism stories. Second is silver bullet stories. Um, this, I'm embarrassed to admit, ran in the New York Times. And you can read the first line. It says, sometimes a soccer ball is more than just a ball. Sometimes it's a lifesaver. That's an example of overclaiming. That you're going way beyond what the evidence about this product, um, a, a football that stays inflated, um, is actually doing. So this is also um, not good journalism, and an example of something that is not what we would want to promote. Third example, favor for a friend. 
You see these stories a lot of times around Christmas or Thanksgiving when we take off our critical journalist hats and say, all right, we're going to do some ni something nice for a do-gooder organization and basically write press releases. Look at the first line. The idea was genius, comma, really, period. Um, one source story, this is not what we're talking about. It's pretty far from what we're talking about when we talk about solutions journalism. Another imposter is the cute cooking class story. This is somewhat of a subtle distinction, but um, these are stories that are um, usually written when um, communities start programs to address a problem. And like the hero worship stories, they're basically there to talk about the program, but they're not interested in the question of whether this program is effective. Has it been effective in other communities? What kinds of, of, of challenges has it run into? Um, they're basically there just to highlight that this program exists and they will often tell the stories of a few people in it. But without that exploration of, is this accomplishing what it's set out to accomplish, we would not consider that to be solutions journalism. Another imposter is the think tank story. And this is a really important distinction. Because a lot of times when I talk about what we do, people say, well, I don't think it's a journalist's job to tell people what should happen. And, and I totally agree. We shouldn't be. A think tank story is one that says, I'm a journalist, and I'm saying, here's what I think the solution is. What we're talking about, real solutions journalism, is covering the news, covering in, an actual thing that's going on on the ground that is an attempt to solve a problem, successful, partially successful, or unsuccessful, and what the evidence is. There's nothing theoretical about it. There's nothing about it that says, here's what I think should happen. It's, it's covering what people are doing, which is covering the news. Afterthought. This is a, House I Live In was a documentary on the um, evils of the war on drugs. And for about 85 minutes, it was about the evils of the war on drugs. And for the last five minutes, it, it mentioned that there are some people who are trying to do some things about it. Didn't go into any depth. It mentioned them. We often do these stories um, at, um, at the end, of, for example, uh, at the end of a series, we might do them at the couple paragraphs at the end of a story. We'll mention, without any depth whatsoever, that there are people who are trying to respond to the problems that I've just spent a long time describing. Another imposter. <clears throat> Stories that tell you how you can become active. Um, how to, here's how to easily write your congressman. Here's, how to, here's a petition to sign. Here's where you can donate money. Some newspapers and other news organizations are comfortable with those, some are not. If you're comfortable with it, that's fine. That's not what we call solutions journalism. You can add it on to a solution story, just like you can add it on to a more traditional story. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is really traditional journalism, just covering the news. And finally, my favorite and our house mascot, Crispy Bacon, the disabled pig whose owner made him a wheelchair to save him from certain death. Um, I don't know why people think this is solutions journalism. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a feel-good story. It makes you go, ah, uh, it makes you feel good about humanity. Maybe that's why, but that's not what we're talking about. I love crispy bacon, and I love crispy bacon-type stories, but they're not solutions journalism. Um, some of you who are my age have lived through some movements in journalism such as these, and Solutions journalism isn't a movement. It's not anything big. It's a practice. It's a tool that we can all use in our reporting. Um, you can integrate it into a beat that you cover. You can use it in enterprise or investigative reporting. It, it's going to be appropriate some of the time, not all of the time. But it's not a big widespread thing. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. So I hope it's a little bit clearer what we're not talking about. And let's go back into what we are. And here is a story that um, ran in the Seattle Times. We have John Higgins here, who is um, a reporter on this project, Education Lab. This was our first flagship project. And it's been running for a year and a half now, John? Um, and they, Seattle Times got tired of doing story after story about how bad the public education system is in Seattle and decided instead to do a series, um, package of stories every month, on a best practice. And um, sometimes they were inside Seattle, sometimes around the state of Washington, sometimes elsewhere. They went to Chicago, for example, to look at a program 
that was successful at getting low-income parents involved in their children's education. And um, we'll talk a little bit later, and John, I'm sure, will talk at the, during this panel about what this has accomplished in Seattle. But the, the definition of solutions journalism, and we're trying to, to make this as, as clear as possible, I would say that there are these four, four features, and I'll let you read them. Before I go into the case for why you might want to integrate this practice into your work, are there any questions or comments? Okay. So why should we do solutions journalism? And the first reason is this. It can make your reporting higher impact. Um, We're, as journalists, this is our normal theory of how our impact works. We cover a problem. We uncover something that people didn't know about or show um, that dimensions of a problem that people, that wasn't widely known. And then someone comes in and solves it. Anybody here think that's been working really well? Um, the problem is, that's not the way society changes. And you instinctively know that. If you're a parent, you don't expect your kid's behavior to change if what you do over breakfast every morning is recite the five things your child did wrong the day before. You have to model good behavior. You have to reward good behavior, and you have to teach good behavior. And there's a version of that that's necessary for society. Society doesn't change unless there are models for change, unless people know that change is possible. And that is one of the things that solutions journalism can do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the first story I ever did that I would consider solutions journalism. And this is what brought me into it. This is what showed me how powerful this can be. In the year 2000, I was working for the Sunday magazine of the New York Times. And I wanted to do a story on the fact that in third world countries where, um, where HIV was massively widespread, Nobody could afford the antiretroviral drugs that would turn it into uh, a chronic disease. People, everybody was going to die of it. That was widely known. The part that wasn't so widely known was the reason for that. What I was reporting on was the pharmaceutical industry, um, their bad behavior, and their collusion with the Clinton administration at keeping countries from making or buying generic drugs, the political pressure they were applying from keeping countries for, um, from using cheap drugs, and how that was... Um, how that was killing people. So I pitched the story to my editor, and he said no. He said, first of all, that's too depressing. I cannot justify subjecting readers to another story about how everybody's dying of AIDS. And second, it's too familiar. Not the, not the, not the pharma stuff, but the fact that it's a death sentence. Everybody in Malawi is going to die. Too familiar. So he didn't want it. So I repitched it. Um, and this time, same story, same investigation of pharmaceutical industry and Clinton administration collusion. But this time it had a different frame. There was one country that was defying that pressure at great political cost, was making generics and providing them for free to all their people, and that was Brazil. So the story then became, here's how Brazil was defying that pressure and what they were doing. And in the course of that, I talked about everything that I wanted to, to say in my more traditional version of the story. That story ran as a cover, um, how to solve the world's AIDS crisis, which I would call overclaiming. Um, I didn't write the headline. Um, but it had numerous advantages over tr the traditional version. Advantage number one, it got into the paper. I mean, that's, that's key. Number two, um, it had a lot of impact. It did bring something that was fresh to the table. People knew everybody was going to die in Malawi. They didn't know everybody wasn't going to die in Brazil. And that was imp important to add to the debate. Um, at the time, the UN was debating whether to set up the Global Fund for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, and the pharmaceutical industry was arguing that poor countries don't have the capacity to give these drugs to their people. And this story showed that that was not the case, and that was a very important point in that debate. Um, 
So Rhiannon Myers is a young reporter who is now at the Houston Chronicle, but was at the Corpus Christi Caller Times, small paper, and did a series called Cost of Diabetes, because Corpus Christi is in the county that has the highest rate of amputations per capita in the United States. And three of her stories were solution stories. One was about the state of Rhode Island and a program they had. One was about a hospital chain in Atlantic City, and one was about a clinic in Amarillo. And here's what Rhiannon said about those solution stories, and I'll let you read that. So these stories, far from being the fluffy feature, she said were the meatiest of the series and sparked the most conversation about what we can do differently and what we're not doing now. Solution stories take away the excuses of people who are not solving problems. Second reason that you should consider doing this, it's just good journalism. Our hashtag today, the whole story. Um, you know, we all read a lot of these stories this summer. Um, but you read not enough of these. How Nigeria stopped Ebola, how Mali did. Um, they were part of the story and needed to be told. And in fact, it turned out to be a hugely important part of the story because they showed what worked and what has eventually, what has now worked in, in other countries. Um, if you just cover the problems, you're leaving something out. And you're leaving out information that not only your readers need, but everyone needs for society to be able to have a discussion about how to solve problems. Third reason, audience engagement. Um, my story in about AIDS, drugs, prices, um, was not tweeted at all. Nobody put it on Facebook. Nobody shared it on social media. None of those things existed. If it had been published later, though, it would have been very, very widely shared, tweeted, Facebooked, et cetera, because solution stories, we know this for a fact, get very widely shared. People like to share them. Um, people like to read them. There was a story that AP did call about young adults' um, consumption of news in 2008. And, and what they found will not surprise you. People are tired of, of reading only about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket. They tune out. They go back to bed and pull the covers over their head. But when they find that there are people working to solve problems in ways that are newsworthy and interesting, they tune back in again. Um, AdLab had a big effect in Seattle. It's still having a big effect in Seattle. And here's some of the results of a survey that they did. And John will talk more about this. The in University of Texas' Engaging News Project did a... Um, a survey, we provided them, our participation in it was providing them with two versions of a story, a traditional story about a problem and a story that also included um, a response to that problem. And then they asked people, uh, people who had read one or the other version, some questions. And you can see the difference. I think this, the interesting one is the second one. Would read more articles from the same newspaper. Far more people who read the solution story said that. So there's a spillover effect. It makes people tune back in. Um, our, our fixes column in the New York Times is very often about stuff that you would never expect to have a, uh, a wide readership. My, we, had, we ran a column about a month ago about um, a project in India that was helping villages to um, not just put toilets in, but actually use them. And when we put it in, when we send it in, our editor said, why don't I just run a, a line that says, don't read this this week, because nobody's going to read this. And in fact, it ended up on the most emailed list. I would certainly not have done that if it was about the problem of, of open defecation in India and did not have that solutions part. Um, here's 
it doesn't, not often that this happens, but it happens occasionally. Top of the most email list, top of the most shared on Facebook list are both fixes pieces. So these things get shared. People spend more time reading them. So to summarize, why should I do solutions journalism? Here are the three reasons. It's impactful, it's good journalism, and it's engaging to your audience. Now, a lot of times when people hear about solutions journalism, they have a vague feeling this is not kosher somehow. This is really not journalism. And here's why. Here's why we think that. In our profession, if you say that something is a problem and you've got it wrong, you've committed a misdemeanor. If you say something's working and you get it wrong, you've committed a felony. Um, nobody wants to be seen as, as excessively gullible. And so we're afraid, what if I write something and it actually turns out that a month later the project fails or blah, blah, blah. Um, well, a couple things to say that. First of all, I assume we are being equally as careful when we're investigating problems, right? I mean, you know, it may not be terrible for you to call something a problem and get it wrong, but it's certainly terrible for the people you're writing about. So um, it actually is no more difficult to get it right. It's just the perceived penalty for getting it wrong is higher. And the answer to that, the way to mitigate that is to keep your reporting to what you can say is happening right now and what the evidence is right now. You're never going to say this is the solution. Um, you're never going to maybe not even say this is a solution. All you're saying is here's a problem, here's some people who are trying to respond to the problem, and here's the evidence of what that's doing so far. And that evidence can be randomized control trials if you're really lucky, or it could just can be you know, here's what affected people say and here's what experts say. It's the same kind of evidence you would use for a traditional story. If you limit yourself to what is going on now, then you will not get into trouble if things change. So the next section, um, we're going to talk about how to do solutions journalism and we will be discussing and doing a, some group exercises. But before that, any questions or comments? Okay, so how do we do solutions journalism? Um, I'm going to go back to this. It's solutions journalism if it has these four qualities. Concentrates on a response and how it happened, not just profiling a person. Evidence and looking for effectiveness. Not just inspirational, but also gives people information about how something was done that's useful and discusses limitations and avoids reading like a puff piece. So um, we had passed around by electronically, and you also have copies on your table, um, a story by each of our six um, national visitors. Um, I'm scared to ask this question. Who read them? Raise your hand. Oh my gosh, that's great. Super, okay, so, so we can actually have a discussion about this. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about some of these stories. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. Hopefully we'll have something to say about all of them. And look at those stories in the light of these questions. Now, obviously, these are all journalists we greatly admire or they wouldn't be here. These are all stories we admire. But there is no such thing as the perfect piece of solutions journalism. Every story has some things that it's missing, and that's true of these stories as well. So I'm sure that the people who wrote them would not be upset if you had some um, comments about, about that part. I mean, we, we, want you to, we want you to praise, but we also want you to discuss um, how you, you feel that they might be made better if you feel that way. So um, let's first of all talk about the prob this last problem, discussing the limitations of what you're writing about and avoid reading like a puff piece. Would, would anyone please think about how one of the stories does that and tell us? Look at one that you read closely. Yes, and tell us, uh, we have another mic somewhere? Fred, do we have another mic? That's okay, I have a quote, so pardon me. I thought the one about um, children, um, 
the story about um, helping children focus. And um, I thought that was really good. And it was almost a puff piece. But it had, um, I think the limitations were um, demonstrating how many kids had really benefited from it and the kids who weren't using it, what, they're, um, what was happening with them. OK. So, so what, what John did with that piece was show the evidence that showed that people who were in the program were benefiting more than not benefiting. And that's what, for you, took it, kept it on this side of being a puff piece. OK. What else? I thought we did have another mic. That's it. This is it? Oh, no, there were two. There were two. It was Just regarding limitations in the Maine health care, talking about how it might work in northern rural Maine, but maybe not in a city where the hospitals would be more cutthroat and less likely to collaborate. OK. Good. What else? And I think the limitations were, were fascinating just to hear how this is just getting off the ground. And it seems like you know judges, depending on their own situation, might treat people differently. And, and some of the, the suits that defendants might file might file in um, response to how they're treated in that court. That's a really important point, that they were just getting off the ground. We cover news. News, by definition, is about what's new. Things that are new don't often have a lot of evidence behind them. So there is this built-in tension. But you can write about new things as long as you're clear with the reader of what the evidence does and does not say. Um, you can say, this is new. There's not, there's not a lot of evidence, but what we know so far is X and Y and Z. Uh, who else? I thought the uh, seeking safety, the zero tolerance policy piece was interesting. And two things struck me. One was that it was pretty honest that this guy, Teske, was somewhat self-promoting. And I thought that was important to be to disclose that that he, that this was also benefiting him, and and also that he had to raise a lot of money, and that kind of those type of large grants that he got are not necessarily easily transferable. That it took so much resources to make this program work. Good. Anyone else? On the education story, too, I, I wasn't sure I found the evidence compelling that this project was more effective than, say, previous anti-bullying. So there was a slight rise in the GPA, but it wasn't big enough that I found it convincing. But it was a great piece. OK, thank you. Um, oh, you have a mic. Yay. OK. Anyone else? Wait, wait, wait. It's not for a particular story, and maybe this is outside solutions journalism, but is it solutions journalism if you report on something that doesn't work, if you report on a solution and why it failed? Yes. So I didn't see that. So the what, we usually are choosing responses to problems because they work, but you don't have to have it. When you start investigating, you don't know how it's going to work out, and it's okay if it doesn't work. It's okay if it works somewhat. You'll notice that in these, that the limitations, writing about what is not working in these strengthens your story. You do not have to find a response to a problem that has no limitations, in part because they don't exist. But you don't have to find that. Your story has more credibility and authority if you can say, and here's the challenges it's facing, and here's some limitations, and here's why it might be hard to replicate. But it's very important. And I've written solution stories all the time about stuff that doesn't work. Um, you know, if, if, if you're writing for the Detroit Free Press and Ford is starting a program to promote wellness among its employees and Boeing failed with that same program, that would be interesting for Detroiters to know. I mean, that's a, that's a really good solution story, even though it's about something that's failed. There's one back there. Also in the story about the healthcare collaborative, um, just pointing out that the um, significance of individual choices in their everyday health and that there's only so much that was able to be controlled by the people who were going into mm -hmm. their homes. Yep, very important. Okay. Um, so um, let, let's open it up a bit. And, and um, the other three are very similar in that you're talking about 
what's, what's, what do we know about the effects of this? That's a really important part of solution stories. Does anybody want to talk about that? Or particularly about how, what the structure of the story was that allowed the reporter to show that in a way that kept the reader reading? What, what made, I think all these pieces were pretty compelling. What made them compelling is my question. I, I wanted to say I, I particularly like the way the story about the Iraqi couple from ISIS and the addressing of diabetes um, was written and how it was compelling. I, I come from a community with a number of immigrants. Um, I'm sorry, refugee population. And it's, it's, it was just well done. It was, he found the right people to tell the story and went through the process. And I thought he did a really good job with that story. I enjoyed it a lot. It had evidence and effects. It, he showed the evidence and he showed how it, he expressed how it was affected. Mm -hmm. Good. What else? Um, also on the subject of, of sources, just finding sources who seemed like they were willing to be candid about what worked and what didn't work and having someone who trusted you enough to present that fairly. Is there a particular story that you um, I thought that the, the healthcare story did that well and the, the nurse who was talking about kind of the different approaches. Mm -hmm. So one, one way to make these stories compelling is our usual practice in journalism of having people as characters in them, right? We, we want to know what happens to people. When I say solutions journalism stories aren't hero worship stories, it doesn't mean you don't have characters. You have to have characters. But what you're showing is the characters at work. You're showing what they're doing. You're showing them in action, which actually is much more fun than static, um, than just sort of sitting down and interviewing them. You're showing them in action, doing something or being affected by something. And the, you're, the way you get into how that response is working and what the evidence is, is through the experience of your characters. So it is really important to still, to, ha to have those characters. What else? In the ruler story about social and emotional learning, I thought having the um, embedded video, kind of along the lines of what you were just saying, you were introduced to one of the characters pretty early on through a video that was featured. And that, I clicked on that, watched that, and it, it made me want to, Keep, keep reading, I think. What else? Anything else about these stories you want to say? Yep. I thought the, uh, the story on juvenile justice used very plain language um, when talking about teenagers and the decisions they make. The word stupid choices as opposed to negative consequences. So the plain language kept me relating to it and I thought, I thought that was very effective as opposed to really hoity-toity language that reads like a, like a research paper. So. Um, I, in the healthcare story, the, um, the stats that show that that community is uh, basically compared to other communities doing much better because it's uh, when you read a lot of these stories that tend to feature why this program works, or you, uh, without the stats, you you don't you wonder whether they're just choosing the people <coughs> to make the program look good because the program provides the people that that make it look good. So if you have some some kind of and some other stories do this too, have some some statistical backup so you can test well is this. Is this just, uh, you know, just give me the person that will say this thing is great as opposed to, uh, you know, this is why we're picking this program, you know, because the stats show that. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, is, is Noam here? Not yet. Um, 
I, my guess is that he actually found, decided to go to Bangor because of the data, not the other way around. Um, he, he ran the numbers. Who, what is a very poor community in America that, that still has good health indicators and came up with Bangor, Maine? Um, and that's why he decided to go there. So that's, that's often a way of finding stories that gives you a comfort level because you, if, you're, if you trust the data, if it's a database that's credible, then, um, then that proof is right there. And then your job is to, to show how they did it and, um, and then you know, find, to tell the story about it. But then you're not really in the situation of, of having to prove over and over and over again to the reader, yeah, this is worth writing about, this is worth writing about, because the numbers will, will say that for you. Who else? I thought in John's uh, education story, the use of a quote snagged me as a reader and caught my attention at the problem, and that is the, when a child doesn't read well, we teach. When a child doesn't do well in math, we teach. When a child doesn't behave well, we discipline. And that, as a reader, that caught me and thought, okay, that's, that's a good example of the problem. It sort of set up the story nicely. Yeah, that was really a memorable quote, and it really reframes the whole issue. You just really look at the problem in a different way after reading that. Super important quote. Anything else? Okay, so um, do we always do solutions journalism? No, of course not. Um, some stories are ripe for this approach, and many, many are not. In general, these are the questions you have to answer yes to if you're going to try and look for a solution story. Is it a widespread problem that lots of people are trying to solve? Because if that's the case, then some of their responses are going to be more newsworthy than others, more successful or failures in an interesting way. Um, it's very difficult to do solutions journalism stories about events and, and issues that are truly sui generis. Um, however, news events often are sui generis, but what's behind them often isn't. Um, we had a, um, a building explode in the East Village in New York City a couple of weeks ago, and it turned out the problem was the owner of a restaurant in the first floor had been siphoning gas illegally, and when, when uh, Matt Fliegenheimer of the Times did a second day story on it, like it might have been a third day story at that point, he talked about how Con Ed, our utility, was really bad at um, finding and pursuing um, misuse of the gas lines, and he talked about Unitil. Is that, that's what it's called here, New Hampshire's utility, and how they had a good program in place to do it. This was part of his story. Um, so you, if you are looking at a news event that's caused by a widespread problem, then you can do, as a second day story, a story about who's doing this better. How could, the, how could New York have avoided this problem? Con Edison could have had practices more like what they're doing in New Hampshire. I will provide this slide deck to everybody, so I should have said that earlier. Don't feel like you have to take notes um, on one point, point you want to remember. So you can't find a solution story. You can look very broadly. You can look to something in another part of the country or um, um, another, another country. Um, you can also look more narrowly. Is there a small project in a neighborhood in your area that's really intriguing and showing a, an interesting response to a problem? Maybe it's really new and really small, but it's exciting. People like it. Um, people will talk about it. That could be a solution story. Solution stories don't have to be the whole solution. They can be a solution to a tiny little part of the problem, as long as it's a part that's relevant to your readers. For example, pedestrian traffic deaths. You can look for a city that has gone to zero pedestrian traffic deaths, but it might be more interesting if your city, the reason you're writing about that is that you have pedestrian traffic deaths on left turns at night. Look for a place that has reduced its deaths on left turns at night if those statistics exist. Um, you know, you may want to be looking at who is, who's brought the cost down, who's provided more access, who's, who's 
got a better response to this problem for Hispanics or for older people. Whatever the small slice of it is that's most relevant to your audience, that's what you want to look for when you're looking for a solution story. We get questions all the time. Find us a county that's reduced obesity over the last 10 years. Unfortunately, the answer in the United States is there isn't one. Um, but there are counties that have made progress in other ways, increasing physical activity, slowing the rate of gain of obesity, reducing child obesity. There are smaller slices of that problem that are interesting to know about. Then, third thing, the most important thing I'm going to say to you all day, define solution down. It does not have to be the solution, because there is no such thing to the problem. It can be an interesting, partially successful response to a small slice of the problem, as long as it's a good story. And you all know what a good story is, because this is the question you ask every day with every story you write. You have your criteria. that's a little counterintuitive in that a reader might say, well, why are you telling me this story if it's not that successful? It's got all these limitations. Why are you even taking the time to, to write a story about it? So, why, yeah. why did you choose that story to write about? Why? Like, you wrote a story that a reader, a reader mm -hmm. wants to read. Why did you choose this story? It's got all these problems. Why did you choose that story? Probably because it was interesting on some level. Or they had interesting characters or it was maybe somewhat high profile within a community as an attempted solution. The answer doesn't have to be, because this is the way to solve this big problem. Um, so what we're going to do now is find our own solution stories. So I'm going to ask you to break up into groups of four people, I'd say maybe five in a group. Um, I would like to have our guests from out of town distribute themselves among the groups. So one of you, you're in this group, you're in that group. And here's what you're going to do. Everybody's going to spend a few minutes just sitting here right now. Think to yourself and jot down a few possible solution stories on an area you cover. And they can be hypothetical. Now, don't do this in your real newspaper, but for the purposes of the exercise, think about what a solution story might look like on your beat. Then we're going to get together in our groups, discuss them, and present one or two of those responses to all of us when we get back together again. Yes. Mike's coming behind you. I think we're smart to go first, because I bet this is going to come up at a, a bunch of tables. But we have a, uh, an opiate abuse crisis in the state. And I think we've all done stories about you know the number of uh, overdose deaths going up, police departments having an awakening that it's a public health issue, uh, not just a, a criminal issue. But we haven't heard a lot of solutions. Um, I've heard I've heard endless problems from judges, from doctors, from you know schools, and so. And I know the readers are really interested. So that would be a great project. How would you go about finding a, a solution story? What's the first step? Well, we talked a little bit about a series like How I Got Clean, um, but which would be a way to uh, personalize it. But then it couldn't just be somebody who was heroic and just decided one day they were going to give it up. But maybe there was a pathway for them where uh, you know, there was a particular treatment they were able to access. Or it took them 60 days, but when they finally got into a program or one of their friends, that whatever it is, that, that would be a way to sort of get into the story. But like I said, I've heard all the different facets of the problem, but I haven't heard where it's working particularly. So what would be some of the who would you first contact, or where would you go to start reporting on this story? Give me the first three phone calls you would make, or things you would Google. Well, we've, um, we've done, in, uh, in our city, we've had panels with, um, with judges and doctors and all the rest of them. And I mean, you could revisit that. But I, I think maybe to get into this, I'd talk to some of the people who have stood up at these meetings and um, talked about where they were and where they are now, and just say, how did you get there? And you know what can we learn from that? Okay, that's great. Who else would you talk to? How how would you how would you do this to to 
as you said, not be sort of one-off, here's a heroic person story. Well, I personally saw an interesting guy on television, I try to track him down, where he was talking about the sort of psychological reasons behind um, addictive behavior, who's drawn to it, why throwing people in jail um, is not the solution because it causes social isolation. But, um, I, you know, I, I might s sit in this room right here and get a really good idea. Anybody have any ideas for who this journalist could come to? Actually, so, so, please, let's say, say our names and, who, and what you cover. I'm Howard Altshuler, and I'm the executive editor at the Social Media Group, which is a couple of dailies and some weeklies in New Hampshire. Great. And from now on, let's, let's say our names. Sure. Uh, names Dan Habib, I'm a documentary filmmaker based at UNH, University of New Hampshire. I worked for in, in newspapers for 20 years before that. Um, so I was just going to add to what you covered really well, I thought, was um, how to get kids from ever stopping, to ever entering into this opiate abuse, because a lot of this is starting, you know, with young people, 17, 18, it's become a less, less of a drug abuse issue for just, you know, people you would just consider kind of the margins of society and much more mainstream for a lot of people. So is there an approach in schools that's been successful somewhere in New Hampshire or nationally to, to, to honestly prevent young people from ever dabbling with heroin? And how would you find out about that? Um, I think I would talk, I would work some of the educational networks in New Hampshire. I think there's a pretty, there's a strong um, NEA branch, there's a strong school administrators association, there's a strong special ed administration. There's, so I think I would start with the, the administrators of those groups and then ask me, because they know kind of on the ground which schools are doing some really pro progressive and proactive things in that area. Okay, good. You had some ideas? Um, I, Don DeAngelis from New Hampshire Public Television. I would um, call the Gloucester Police Department. They have a program where people can come in and um, just hand over their drugs, hand over, they won't be put in prison. They've started a new program there. So I, we're, we're doing, we've been doing some long-term research on the problem and how to find programs that are working. And I just, that popped up for me when I was doing research this weekend. I just, I Google, I read, I, people send me stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Sean from the Union Leader and Sunday News, and we've been doing some reporting on this epidemic, and we've turned to solutions recently, interestingly enough. Among the stories that I've done recently, um, the children, the babies, born to mothers who are using when they're pregnant are born in withdrawal. So we just did a story on Concord Hospital has a program where they're offering therapeutic um, music and they do aromatherapy for these babies. They bring in harpists and they put them through withdrawal. And that was like, this, these are the littlest victims of this epidemic. So we did that story. We just did a story in Sunday's paper on a Laconia police officer who has been hired six months ago. Um, they have a totally different approach. He gives out a card to people that he interacts with. He goes to every overdose and he, and on the street he gives out his card that says the Laconia Police Department understands that substance abuse is a disease. You can't fight this alone. If you need help, please call us and ask for support. They do that, they don't arrest. They drive people to treatment when they get to, he's taken calls at midnight and he drives people to treatment centers at that moment when they're ready. So there is some reporting being done on the solutions right. to this. So it's it, good timing for this, thank you. Great. Okay, another story. Who else? All right, I'm going to start cold calling. <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Not one we got to discuss yet, but one that came up for me and uh, is that uh, it just recently came out that uh, we have a severe shortage of foster homes in our state. Uh, we have about 1,000 foster kids coming into our system every year in our state. We only have capacity for 600, you know, so it's a big gap. I'm a former foster parent, so it kind of resonated with me. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm Matt Mauer. I'm the editor of Business New Hampshire Magazine. We're B2B, so I'm still trying to find out what our business connection to that story might be, so I invite anyone to steal this. But really, you know, for me, it's a solution taking a look at um, a number of ways that you could take a look at this. One, taking a look at other states that have gone through this, and are there other solutions out there state, uh, across the country where a state's been able to turn around a shorter situation? Uh, you could talk to foster parents about, you know, um, both present and past, about their experiences and why they have either stayed in the system or not. There's a lot of reasons people go into the system. 
um, myself being one that we went to foster to adopt, and we did, we adopt two boys, and we're done. Um, and so when that family drops out, how do you replace those families? So for me, it's, an, it's a really interesting story that cries out for some solutions in our state as to you know, how do we address that as a state when, when we're facing that big a shortage. One obviously hit Google, but two, I, I would talk to social workers, the head of the uh, and, and DHHS, to see. I mean, they're very active, and they're going to be aware of um, other solutions that they may be taking a look at um, that haven't implemented yet. Uh, we have a rich nonprofit community here in New Hampshire um, and Clean Child and Family Services that deals with uh, these type of issues that would be able to either talk about solutions that are in our state that they're taking a look at or solutions they know of other states that they find intriguing. And so those would be different pathways that I would take a look at. Who else? Hi, uh, Roger Carroll from The Telegraph, Nashua. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the heroin uh, issue also. Um, but one of the other... Uh, topics that came up is the exodus of young people from the state. Uh, New Hampshire is, uh, well, we're, we're getting older. A and uh, um, the, the implications of that, I mean, what, what, what keeps people here? Uh, the, the, um, we seem to have, uh, people are graduating with incredible amounts of debt if they go to college at all. Uh, and we're like fourth in the country in high school graduates. But I think we're down around the middle, 26, 27, uh, in kids that we send off to college. Um, and when we send them off, a lot of them don't come back. Um, so, uh, and why are they not coming back? Uh, lack of jobs, uh, and it, a lot of it's linked together. But the, the, the exodus of, of young people, uh, you know, the last one out, turn off the lights. So that, that, was, that was an issue. How would you look for a solution story around that? I don't know. Um, I think there are some real good statistics and, and data built around, I mean, the numbers are what they are. Uh, the, uh, Michael talked about his family. Uh, it was it the whole family left? His aunt, uncles and aunts, they all left. Uh, I'm the oldest of seven. We're all basically still in the area because nobody else would have us. Um, the, the, uh, but uh, I think you could look at it anecdotally. Uh, who's left? Who's come come back? Uh, the the um, uh, I think th there are some rich character-driven opportunities. I think there uh, from somebody who's maybe living in uh, in North Carolina or the Sun Belt, uh, you know, and still but still has deep ties here. Mm. Um, why did you leave? Why did you want to come back? Those are still problem-focused, though. How would you look at what's going on as a response to that problem? These people are going somewhere, right? Some state is getting your influx of young people. Um, how are they doing that? Why are people moving to that state? What can the state do? Uh, what should the state be doing? I think there are some policy issues that uh, maybe we should, should address. I think uh, there are some people who are trying to address them. Uh, I'm not, you know, it, obviously it's going to play out over time, but. How would you find who's addressing, who's trying to address those issues? Oh, I, 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 I think there are any one of a number of politicians who would like you to think that they have the answers, uh, and they would probably line up to talk to you. Um. Okay. All right. Who else has some ideas on this? Okay. Everybody at this table. <laughs> well, we were, we were talking, I'm complaining about the lack of data, and but this is one place where there would be data. I mean, you have census statistics about which communities are losing people and which communities aren't. I think, the New York, I think it was the New York Times that just did this huge map about people who are, uh, who are um, going to different states and how many people are keeping. So one way is to just look at that data and see who in New Hampshire is keeping their people and uh, then see what, try to figure out what they were doing right, just similar to the healthcare story. I, uh, the limitations with data in New Hampshire are, is a big problem. Now, I was thinking of one story on on workers' comp, uh, which, uh, you know, what, what companies, because I'm a business reporter, ha, you know, is able to keep their comp costs down and what they're doing right. But 
that's all confidential. We, we can't find out the comp rates of everybody. So, so that would be, and then there's other data where we just don't have it. But here's one case where I just said, oh, well, that data is easy, that's accessible. So you just go after the data, find out which communities are working, and maybe which ones are not, which are on the worst end. That's not solutions journalism, but you can compare and contrast. What if what you ended up finding was rural communities are losing people and urban communities are attracting them? And that's what the data said. Is that a solution story? That's more a trend story, but what you want to do is look under all the urban communities, which are urban communities, the ones that are similar, and which ones are, are, are working or keeping people, and the same thing with the rural communities. Try to compare apples and apples. Mm -hmm. Another thread to that story is, okay, we have these rural communities that are losing people, and maybe there's no way they're going to get them. They're going to they're lose them. So what are some of the communities that are aging, and how are they addressing it? You know, AARP likes to talk about gray entrepreneurs and people who are doing the things that you expect young people to do. Um, towns survive, and how are they surviving? How are they, how are they just accepting that we're not going to try to bring these young people in, we're going to try to find out what we can do with the people we have? I was going to say, I wrote a story about this recently, and I did contact uh, University of New Hampshire, their career center, and they had done a survey of, I think it was 2013 graduates, showing the percentage of those who had uh, attended UNH and were from New Hampshire or were from other states, and the likelihood that they would stay in New Hampshire if they're, you know, from New Hampshire if they were from other states. So there is that sort of data out there, um, which I think that was interesting to look at. But in terms of, I don't know if I really provided that good of a solution because I did look at the funding of the university. I know it's below the national average. The national average, at least the officials at UNH told me, was around 50% of the universities were funded um, versus UNH, I know it was well below that. Um, so one of my solutions was that, of course, oh, the state legislature should uh, provide more funding to the university system of New Hampshire, but of course I'm not sure if that was you know, perhaps I should have sought more other solutions to that story. Now, that's a really interesting question because can you do a solution story where the solution is more government funding, especially in this state, right? Um, and um, does anybody have an, have an answer to that question? Anybody have a, a way that that particular story could be done? Yeah, I'm Gail. I work for the Laconia Daily Sun. Uh, one of the things that I've found in terms of solution journalism and the state legislature is, in my opinion, the state has what I consider to be a very regressive tax system. It's heavily dependent on property taxes because there is our only statewide tax thing, which makes housing particularly difficult for young people to find. Uh, even in Laconia, your average house, average rental apartment in a not a very nice neighborhood in a probably heavily subsidized apartment would be $800 a month, um, which you'd need to make a considerable amount of money to do that. But one of the other solutions I would look at that I see happening in Laconia, and this is kind of an old story to the Laconia people, but we, I mean to the New Hampshire people, but we just had a, a very big and a, exhaustive redo of our technical center, which is the Hewitt Technical System, which is actually addressing with our local businesses some of those jobs that they have had the hardest time finding people for. Uh, New Hampshire has a lot of um, precision machinery. It's, it's, it's stuff that can't be done in many other countries because it's ball bearings, it's work that is so specific and so specific, you know what I mean, so rigorous that, and some of our industries focus on that. It's getting the technical schools to get the people, some of these jobs don't require a college degree, but they pay 70, 80, $90,000 a year, they're very good jobs. And I think our technical schools are doing a good job of trying to address that to get some of these people to the area. Yeah, that's a very important point. Um, and then I'm going to get back to the point over there. <clears throat> it's very important to, to figure out what the problem specifically is. 
if people are leaving because there aren't jobs, then that's a great solution story. If that turns out not to be the reason, I suspect it is, yeah. Right. But, right. So you need to figure out what is the small slice of the problem that is most affecting you and then look for what is going on that's a, that's a noteworthy response to that. Um, back to the political question, which is very important. Um, the, um, I'm not sure that this would work, but this, is, this, but this kind of question comes up a lot. And one answer is, what, what's the problem here? The problem is lack of political will. Is that correct? If everybody agrees that pro Program X should be funded, that's a solution, you know, we can show that it saves money in the long run, but there's, there's not the political will to do it. Then that's the problem you have to try and find who's doing better on. Has there been another state that found a way or an organization that organized people to solve that political will problem in a similar situation? Now, New Hampshire may be sui generis, but um, maybe not. I was just going to say, so uh, I'm Sam Evans Brown. I'm with New Hampshire Public Radio. We sort of, uh, when we were talking about the young people leaving the state problem, uh, we just got into talking about how that turns into you're just doing a story about how the university system wants more funding, and and you're wading into this years-long debate that, uh, you know, sort of, in my mind, pitching the solution as more, the university system needs more funding, you sort of are turning off a large portion of the audience as soon as as soon as that's the solution that you're talking about. And I was just thinking of maybe another way, instead of doing a story about why does New Hampshire have no political will to to fund its university, maybe another way to do it is how could a university that doesn't get very much funding attract more in-state students? Um, and you know, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that there's a very clear answer to that. I haven't done any reporting on it, but it's just a thought as to how you could dodge the problem of the political question. That's a good thought. These are very creative. I like these. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Casey. I work for the Concord Monitor. Um, because this is a story that kind of naturally like turns outward outside of New Hampshire, I think it might be a good idea to maybe like find some students or maybe connect with UNH's Career Center or something and see you know where a lot of New Hampshire students are going and then find out you know okay what makes those areas attractive to New Hampshire students or look generally and maybe connect with someone who studies like demography or um, areas that are doing a good job at attracting young people and see you know what do they do right and is that possible to translate here. Good. Yeah. Another way of looking at that problem too is find other states that don't fund education much. Colorado, very, very similar to New Hampshire. I think the Colorado University system maybe gets 6% of their funding from the state. Yet, where do all the young people want to live in? Colorado. Um, Chris, I work with the National Telegraph, but I was in Vermont for seven years uh, before moving back to New Hampshire. Uh, Vermont has a very similar problem with young people leaving, and all three of the northern New England states, if you include Maine, have, I think they're the three of the four oldest states in the country, and just the, the you know, average population or the average age keeps going up and up and up. Um, so it could be more of a regional thing too, because there are pockets. Uh, if you look at uh, Chittenden County, Vermont, in the Burlington area, they're having an increase. Um, we were talking a little bit about Portsmouth, New Hampshire. People want to go and live in Portsmouth. If you go to Portland, Maine, people want to go to Portland, Maine. Uh, what are some of these small areas doing uh, right? Uh, a lot of it has to do maybe with education. That kind of goes back to what Gail was saying. Uh, is that a solution to this problem? Can we get more tech schools? Can we get more associate degree programs in these areas to attract more young people? I'd like to go not just to the uh, to the uh, career centers, but to the alumni centers of either the colleges or the high schools. Where are they sending their alumni newsletters? And, and then perhaps get in touch with the people who are receiving those newsletters and ask, why do you live in Des Moines? Or why do you live in San Francisco? If 50% of the people who leave New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine say it's because of the weather, then you've got a problem with the solution story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Everybody talks about the weather, but um, any, any other ideas we want to talk about? OK. Um, I, I'm Jack. I'm with New Hampshire Public Radio. So on the, on the young people leaving the state story, I, that's one I find myself really skeptical that there is a very good solution, because I feel like people leave the state because they go to places where they feel like things are happening. So when you look in New England, Boston is an interesting place to live. Portland is a really interesting place to live. Burlington is, um, because there's a lot of young people. I, I don't know where if, if it's the chicken or the egg. I don't know if young, you know, so there's great restaurants and great music because young people are there, or vice versa. Um, but I, I just, it's just sort of a, you know, it's like a vague idea that I, I don't have a lot of hope that there's a, that there is a great solution for that story. Um, but that's not to say that. But I do think that maybe there are towns that could be anomalous in New Hampshire to to, to the greater trend, and maybe that'd be a place to do it. But yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's a point. Although there there's uh, there's a city in my home state that Detroit, for example, that has greatly revitalized its inner city by bringing starting from from very little and bringing critical mass of young people. Yep. And, and just to just to sort of you know piggyback on what Jack said a little bit. I mean, it it's it sort of makes me ask myself what stories really lend themselves to solutions journalism and that maybe this one is a really tough one because the the solution is so complicated. I mean, if you think about, you know, why people are leaving New Hampshire, it's because they're going places where, where things are happening, quote unquote. How do you build a place where things are happening? I mean, you can't just like take Portsmouth and plop it into Berlin and then all of a sudden people are moving to Berlin. But what if things are happening in part because the city deliberately set out to, to do things to make things that happen? I mean, th th this may not be entirely spontaneous. There may be programs that happened to produce that, which would be interesting to know about. Right, and I guess, I guess the, why I question whether or not this is a story that really lends itself to solutions journalism is that you wind up with this sort of opus, you know, where, where you're talking about all of the changes that, that happen in terms of, you know, uh, you're talking about like zoning laws and, and regional planning and, and you know, uh, education and, and, you know, you wind up with a story where you can't point to one thing and it's a lot of things and you don't know which is the most important. So, you know, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I'm just saying that uh, there are perhaps easier solutions journalism stories to do. next to a few of them right here that have come here, come back to New Hampshire or from away for jobs. And so if you, one of the first contacts I would make would be to groups like Day Work Play New Hampshire and say, find me some success stories. Find me some companies that are, that are attracting young people from around the country. And then you get a little bit, and you know, we could then develop some case studies that I think other people can then say, well, I could do that too. And therefore, you're, like you were saying, it's not solving the problem, it's finding an aspect of the problem that can be solved. And I think that would be a way to attach to, to attack this from a solutions journalism perspective. And I don't think this is. <laughs> that's a great idea. Um, the, that's an important question you raised, though. What, how do you deal with a very complex issue when there is so much that has to happen for something to change. How do you do that? Any ideas? Uh, I would say you, you attack it in pieces. Uh, to what someone else said, um, one of the issues that Laconia tends to have is I don't find their zoning very progressive. Um, we have a downtown that is virtually empty, yet the zoning department has decided that every little business that opens needs to have 12 parking spaces. Um, <laughs> you know, you, your parking problem is when no one's parking on your downtown. Um, so, you know, I mean, you could take one piece of it, like, the, like planning and zoning, and say, you know, what are we doing wrong? Why, why don't people want to come down here? Is it because of our setback laws? Is it because our planning doesn't lend it to businesses that want to come here? Is it because 
a bit, I, you know, and, and, and then go into who are the people that are coming back to the state. You know, it doesn't have to be one story. It could be a series of solutions to addressing the, the overall problem. And, and like I said, and some of them are identifying problems. Others are identifying solutions. Um, I think if, if it's an issue that could be seen from a national perspective, but localized, there's there's a group out there for almost every issue that has done a tremendous amount of research and, and evidence-based research. I think if you can find, I do a lot of work in education, inclusive education, disabilities type issues, and almost everything that I want to focus on, somebody has really studied this issue in depth and has done very current, evidence-based, strong research. So if you can take that research and say, all right, we know there's this, we know that in my own world, for instance, including kids with disabilities in regular education yields better outcomes for employment, for transition to college, for social life. What, who's doing that here in New Hampshire really well? And let's focus on that. And I think unless you have that evidence base behind you, it's just this very, it's like a guess. It's a presumption that I think this works. That's an, that's an interesting approach. Look for the ideas that work and then find local people who are carrying those out well. Even if there's not a study of that local idea, then you're on firmer ground. Um, so the, the complexity issue, I think, is um, you don't have to solve the, the whole problem. As long as you know that zoning is a piece of it, education is a piece of it, and they're important pieces of it, then you can, you can do that. And you tell the reader or the listener, Here's why, I'm here's why we're focusing on this. It's a piece of a larger problem, but an important one. As long as you're clear with, with the reader about why you're doing the story, it can be a really small slice of it. It doesn't have to solve the whole issue. Yeah. Um, I'm, I work with New Hampshire Public Television. We produce a series called Changing Aging. It's about aging well. And we've done a, a several programs about dementia, but the latest was about, we, we, we were looking, I don't know if we use the word solution journalism, but what is possible. And what we've done in the past is looked at uh, the issue looking forward as people age, but then we started asking the question, what can people do prior at a younger age to maybe offset or delay uh, the progress of, of, or the progress of uh, dementia if you're um, if you have the gene that will lead to it and so we did some research and we learned about uh, two two uh, doctors at Dartmouth Hitchcock who are promoting very active living starting at a young age both social and physical activity and the benefits that has on um, dementia uh, delaying the onset um, and so it was looking at a complex issue that didn't seem to have any solution and sort of turning the table and looking at what happens at a younger age to not prevent but affect mm -hmm. what happens to uh, people living with dementia. That's a great idea. Yeah. So we started talking at the end of the discussion, so we didn't fully get through all of it, but we were talking about um, end of life issues and the issues around euthanasia as um, really a difficult place to find any solutions, especially in New Hampshire, and as John was talking about, the governor vetoing study commissions um, to even look at the issue. So you know, I'm not sure what you would say either to this about how you find solutions in a really none of the solutions are going to be good in a way. And we were talking about one of the solutions is even looking at how people go to lengths to starve themselves as a solution to this problem and looking at all of um, the problems that go along with that and the toll on families and the toll on the healthcare system as one uh, way to look at that. We can also look at um, you know other states that um, have made um, inroads in this issue and now um, make it legal. But um, we were just talking about how difficult it is on an issue like that to find solutions or talk about them, even if they're bad solutions in many ways, they're difficult to talk about. Um, that's the starvation story, I would sort of, I would not, I don't know if I would consider that a solution story. Um, 
sounds like a manifestation of the problem story that people have to go to this length. But this is a, obviously a widespread problem. Everyone has it. Therefore, some of the responses are going to be more newsworthy than others. Some states have done this better. Why, why would you say that's not an, an avenue to, uh, not a profitable avenue? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. OK. Shall we move on to more, more um, stuff? So um, the sources that you guys mentioned should look fairly familiar. These are the same sources you would use for any story. The difference is this. You're going to ask this question. Who's doing this better? Who's doing, this, who's doing something I should know about on this? OK, um, can we have 10 more minutes? OK, let's just go quickly through some techniques for storytelling. Um, so as we've talked about, solution stories are not devoid of people. But the story is showing what the characters are doing. Um, often it's a, it's a chronological narrative. How do you solve, show them trying to solve a problem, failing, trying again, having partial success, doing this, doing that. And then you're showing what is it that the, the work that that person is doing is different from what others do and, and what can be learned from it. The hero of the story of a solution story is the work. It's what's being done. But you tell that story through people. Also, solution stories have tension. Every good story has tension of some kind. It is obviously not the tension that you find in a new story of this group says X and this group says not X. It's also often not going to be the tension of, uh, of is this going to work or not? Because the headline will often give that away. So what do you do about that? How do you keep the reader reading? Um, how many of you watch a TV show where um, a weekly TV show that has a, um, characters who, who get into mortal danger every week or some sort of danger every week? OK. Um, what show? Scandal. Scandal. OK. Do you have any doubt that at the end of that show, that character will then get out of danger again? OK. You know she's going to live. But it keeps you watching anyway because you want to know how, right? Not knowing the outcome is not necessary for tension. Not knowing how they did it can be the kind of tension that's interesting. How did this group or person or organization or state do something that others did not? What obstacles did they overcome? So very often, we talk about the five W's in journalism. Solutions journalism also adds the very important H. It's, these are how done it's in a sense. And you can structure them like that. And it's, if you have room and you have time, and I realize this is, this is the elephant in the room here, because we don't always have that, details are what gives your story authority and credibility. The more detailed you can be, the less this is going to look like a puff piece. And, um, and often you can try a chronological structure. So some kinds of solutions journalism stories. Positive deviant, working backwards from data. Um, here's Kentucky. What did Kentucky do that other states didn't do? I don't know the answer, actually. But um, that might be an interesting story. If you can find a database, we normally look for the worst performer, and then we pounce. But also look for the best performer. And that, that best performer might be doing something interesting that's worth reporting on. Um, new idea, unproven new idea. Did this city bring down its murder rate by paying people not to kill? Question mark. That's a really good way of putting a headline for a story like this, because you really don't know the answer. Um, but that's OK. If it's an interesting new idea and it's, it, it's a good story, it's worth writing about, then that's a good solution story. You just have to be clear with the reader. Here's what we don't know. Experiments in progress. This is sort of slightly downstream from the new idea. Um, here's a new approach. Just getting started. There's a little bit of evidence. Now, um, often people run into the problem of, gee, this problem of um, getting, I'm not sure exactly what problem that story is solving. But let's say it was, um, it was um, 
in, involving um, more uh, students from low socioeconomic levels in AP classes. Um, there may be this way of dealing with it, and another way of dealing with it that's interesting, and another way of dealing with it. But you are choosing something, and just the act of choosing it can sometimes be seen as you're advocating for it, right? That's a problem we run into. The ways to get around that are to write, first of all, one way is to write about the idea of it. If this approach is being done um, in many places, or for example, if, if you're writing about an organization that's doing something that a lot of organizations are doing, the hero of the story is really the idea here. What is going on here that works? Here's one example of it. There are others, and you'll mention some of the others. But make it clear that you're, you've chosen this organization as an illustration of a wider attempt to solve a problem that's newsworthy. So that's one way of trying to deal with this problem. Um, another way is to, um, as the story, one of the stories in, the, uh, in the, the Concord paper on homelessness does, it mentions three different solutions and then focuses on one of them. But it, by mentioning the other two, it, it reduces the, the uh, risk that it will be seen as advocating for one solution. Can anybody think of other ways of dealing with this? If, you, if you're clear about the limitations, that's obviously going to reduce the advocacy. John? probably went through the same process. They had a problem to solve. There was a thousand solutions out there. They tried solution X and it, eh, and solution Y was a little better. And um, you can get across the idea there's many ways and, and this is one. And But if it's embedded in the narrative of the whatever you're focusing on, I think that the reader stands with them instead of with you. And it's, that's usually more powerful anyway. And you get that kind of how done it and, and I think it conveys this sense of honesty, like this is a complex problem, there's more than one way to do it, and here's our reasoning why we did it this way. That's really good. Um, okay, so um, location transformation, this is a big one. Here's a place that was bad and got better, how did they do it? Um, apples and apples, comparing two places, Keegan Kyle, was starting to do an investigative piece on Santa Ana, he works for the Orange County Register, and how they deal with prostitution, which is not very well. And he wrote a story about that, but, that, but he also included neighboring Anaheim, which had a very different way of dealing with it, that was much more successful, and he put them both in the same story. He basically said, here's Santa Ana, and now here's Anaheim. It wasn't, he didn't do a fancy interweaving of the two, he did block A and block B, but it worked very well. Um, focusing on a program, is um, a good way, and that's what a lot of solution stories are. Here's a particular program. It's a good way of doing something fresh on the subject that your readers are like, oh no, not that again. This is very important. How do you do a solution story quickly and in short amount of words? And um, the answer is it is hard to do. These are, these are enterprise stories in a way, unless you're on a beat that you know so well that you don't really have to do a hell of a lot of work to be able to be confident that what you're writing about is worth writing about. But there are a couple of shortcuts. One is don't talk about the problem. If everybody knows about it, just say it and go on. Nobody needs in New York needed to be told that bed bugs were an issue. Um, um, or do the problem in another story. The other way to do it is to work backwards from data. Then you don't have to spend a lot of, of, your, of, of room and time looking for evidence that this works. If you're going to this story because a database that you trust and you know this database and it's good has said that this is the positive deviant, then that saves you a lot of time and a lot of room. So work backwards. Um, part of a series. Uh, Meg Kissinger is the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel's uh, reporter who covers mental illness. 
and she's done several very, very high impact series um, on Milwaukee, and one of she, what she always includes is another city. And it, this headline, not every newspaper would be comfortable with that, offers a case study for Milwaukee, but clearly the Journal Sentinel was comfortable with that. Um, as a frame for an investigation, turn it around so that if there is an exception, talk about how that exception managed to be the exception, and in that way you're also investigating the problem, like the Brazil story did. Um, so here is our message. We will be talking about this more throughout the day. Um, thank you all for a great discussion, really great ideas. And um, we'll move on to, to Karen. So thank you. <laughs>